Good morning, and welcome to St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Skokie's worship service. Today is the day of Pentecost. May we be open to the Holy Spirit's movement among us. I have just a few brief announcements before we begin our worship service. Thank you to everyone who's helped make today's virtual worship service on YouTube possible. And thanks to everyone who continues to watch and encourages others to watch. Thank you also to everyone who made a donation to the church, enabling us to meet our covenant obligation to the community kitchen of a just harvest last Saturday. We did raise the dollar amount needed by the kitchen to prepare a full meal, which they served curbside as previously reported. Our next turn for the kitchen is Saturday, August 29th. Next Sunday, June 7th is a communion Sunday. This means that we suggest folks worshiping with us via YouTube participate together by having elements from your home ready with you. Please have a small glass of juice, wine, or other beverage you are comfortable with, and a piece of bread with you. When Reverend Lanford prompts us to take and eat or drink, then we shall do so, physically separated, but together in spirit. We practice open communion all are welcome. We continue to keep our health care workers in our prayers. Jennifer Castillo, Maribel Powers, Angela Washet Carras, Christy Lopez, Muriel Tilos, and Charlie Rez Mason. Other people we are praying for are listed in your bulletin, including our graduates Bridget Sturba, Christine Hollerick, Nicole Miller, and Dylan Kahn. Congratulations class of 2020. Those celebrating their birthdays and anniversaries are also in your bulletin. Our Board of Elders continues to meet regularly and reach out to members and friends over the phone. We thank them for their compassion and their commitment. The Worship and Music Committee will meet today after worship and the MICA 6 Committee will meet on Wednesday. Despite sheltering in place, we continue to keep very busy. Your continued gifts are important to keep our ministry alive and healthy at St. Peter's. There are a number of different ways for you to contribute detailed in the front pages of your bulletin. Many more announcements are also available in your bulletin. I encourage you to read through them after the service if you have not done so already. And now, let us continue with our worship. morning or good afternoon or whatever time of day you are joining us will those who are able and willing please stand up for our call to worship when the day of Pentecost had come unlike us this morning they were all together in one place like them we present ourselves to praise and worship the living God from heaven came the sound of a rushing wind, and fire in the shape of tongues rested on each one. Can we hear the wind? Are we ready for the fire? Fill us with your Holy Spirit, O God, that we might tell your glory to all the world. We can say the words that come with Pentecost, Spirit, wind, fire. We can claim an interest in knowing the God of all creation. But how much time have we devoted to this quest? How open are we to God's unpredictable summons and direction? Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, you know we are frightened by strange tongues and people out of control. We want to manage our own lives and assure our own safety. We are afraid that you will ask more of us than we are willing to risk. We do not want others to consider us strange or fanatical. We can be skeptical of dreams and visions. We cannot trust some people you ask us to love. We want to believe 
But how can we know that you are more than our collective imagination, a hope we cling to in our despair? Forgive us and help us, O oh God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. We have confessed. We are growing enough to come forward and receive what Jesus has for us, which is truth and forgiveness and freedom. We are freed from that which holds us back from believing and following, unless we submit to those obstacles once more. In the name of Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord, our sins are forgiven, and a spirit-powered life begins. Alleluia! Amen. Any amount is acceptable and gladly received. 
There is no gift too small or too large. The gifts to and of the congregation will be most gratefully received. And we are grateful for all the gifts we have received up to this point to keep us going. And now our service continues with our word prayer for illumination and the scriptures for today's service, the day of Pentecost. On this day of Pentecost, we remember the powerful movement of the Holy Spirit onto and into the disciples, prompting them to tell the good news. Let us ask the Spirit to move again. Let us ask the Spirit to speak to us through the words we are about to hear, so that they will be good news to us, and so that we, in turn, can bring good news to others. Let us pray. Great God, maker of us all, as you poured out your spirit on the disciples in that upper room almost 2,000 years ago, pour yourself out again upon us, Help us to hear your words rightly, to enjoy them, and to remember them. May they feed our faith and guide our life as your Pentecost people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 14, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Pentecost is a day when many faraway Jews will be in Jerusalem, celebrated at Shavuot, a festival remembering the covenants God made with Noah after the flood, with Abraham and the Israelites about a new homeland, and with Moses on Mount Sinai. But instead of receiving the law, the disciples received the promised Holy Spirit. The reading begins with the last verse we heard last Sunday. Verse 14 of chapter 1, it refers to the 11 disciples after Christ had ascended. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and the tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one of them, each one heard them speaking in the language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed him. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 
Savior. Here ends the reading of the book of Acts. The gospel lesson is a brief one, and one we have not featured on Pentecost for several years, although it is suggested in the lectionary for today. It is John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day of the festival, the great day, when Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no Spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Here is the reading of John and our scriptures for today's service. May God grant us a wise and generous understanding of this God's holy word. Our service continues with a musical meditation by our music director, Ben Wessel. I was unaware. 
I did not read the newspaper as a young person except the comics. Race was not an issue where I lived, or so I thought. Eruptions like what we've seen and which have happened on a lesser scale there, but have happened in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities since 2015, can come as a Minnesota surprise to the insulated, the unknowing, the previously unaffected. The previously unaffected. It is not part or was not part of my experience, what's going on, being treated as someone to be suspicious of, to be afraid of, to perhaps be unwelcome when moving into the neighborhood of my choice, or being candidate, a candidate for a church, uh, enrolling my kids in the school of our choice, in dealing with law enforcement, bankers, or certain churches. I've never experienced that, or had to give any of that a second thought, in reality, or hypothetical. Never had to deal with it, primarily because I'm white. Always have been. White is a skin color, but also more. Time was, I did not have to think about race or involve myself with racial issues until I saw them as a matter of justice, a kingdom of God man. That was my choice. If you are a person of color in a predominantly white world, you have to deal with these issues every day, almost everywhere. There is no choice. By and large, white folks have floated above racial injustice and poverty, ignoring them, supporting them, or thinking of change paternalistically. That's part of what is called white privilege. The privilege of not seeing the problem, not believing there really is one, not seeing racism as a sinful force that's been damaging African Americans and America since the 1600s. If you are familiar with the 12 steps, you'll remember that for Alcoholics Anonymous anyway, the first step is the is the step the person that where he or she admits they have a problem. Quote, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable. It is admitting to one's own self she or he has a deadly, progressive, terminal disease. Admitting there is a problem is the first step to working on a solution. And notice, too, the step begins with the, the plural we. That's helpful. Admitting there is a problem or problems, perhaps a previously unrecognized addiction to racism or to Anglos overall being in charge, and not to forget police brutality disproportionately visited upon people of color, is a first step. Lots of us have been Coming to an admission of a personal, systemic, structural, and historic sin is helped by learning again just how long such oppression has been going on. We thank God for agents of illumination. Last Sunday, the theme of Memorial Day and what our brave men and women died for brought me to focus attention on people of color and the poor who often have their voting rights blocked. I brought up some of the racism of this country's past. When I grew up and when I was growing up, I thought civil rights were a live issue since the 1950s, not grasping what I was later taught in school, that it went hundreds of years further back, centuries of being cheated, bought and sold, enslaved and hated, murdered and more, would have a cumulative effect. The gains of the 1960s, of which I was aware of, and mostly all I was aware of, they were hard fought. Martin Luther King Jr. said, riots are the language of the unheard. Our former Illinois Conference Minister, the Reverend Dr. Jorge Morales, posted in response to the riots in the Twin Cities, the National Guards called in Minneapolis after protesters burned the police station of the four cops that killed George Floyd. 
The police station was evacuated before it burned down. The police had to leave the area to the protesters. A number of other buildings and fires have also been set. Many are saying it is much more than anger over one killing. It's anger over more than 400 years of racism and oppression against peoples with black and brown skin, against peoples of color. Over time, and there has been too little transformation. Coming to grips with the history, reality, and effects of racism and police violence upon people of color, as a people of faith, in the power of the Holy Spirit, involves listening and learning. That helps one to make a full admission, a la that first step. In church, we call it confession. Some know that step one, some know that step one, they've heard it elsewhere, or maybe in a program of recovery. It's not exactly unknown in common speech. But have you ever bothered to hear what step two is? Here is where Pentecost comes back without having to read between the lines. Step two states, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Power greater than ourselves, for those in the Christian church, is the Lord God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. We as a nation, and not just the Twin Cities or Louisville or Georgia, need to be restored to sanity. God the Spirit was poured out onto and into the apostles on Pentecost to spread the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God in language the others understood. People listened as Peter preached the fulfillment of prophecy, forgiveness of sin through Jesus and the will of God. The apostles carried the good news to the known world, giving their lives for it. And it's good that they did proclaim these things. The Roman era was unmerciful. Mercy was considered a point of weakness. It was not a virtue. Women were not highly valued. Slavery was a given. If you were not of Roman birth or had enough money to buy Roman citizenship, you had zero civil rights. That was the insanity of those times. The Christian church, in the power of the Spirit over time, brought lasting, profound change to some of these injustices and worldviews. Mercy became a virtue. And I could go on, but that would be a, come another sermon. Throughout history, the church, which has been sinful and wrong many times, and still can be, has also been blessed, has, has also been a blessed force behind protecting women and writers and therefore families. The erection of hospitals and universities, preserving ancient writings during the Dark Ages, and trying to teach love, honesty, industry, forgiveness, and more over the millennium. In America's history, the church was an active part of the abolitionist movement, and then the American Missionary Association, or AMA. That group, the AMA, began many of the historically black colleges and universities, and they, there is an affiliation with the United Church of Christ because of those, because through the AMA and those, those institutions. Churches also supported laborers who were organizing when few others saw or cared about the protections they needed. We know churches were an essential part of the 20th century nonviolent human rights and peace movements. That's the church and the power of the Spirit. That is acting on the belief that a power greater than ourselves, God, through community, could lead them and the world closer to sanity closer to God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm in favor of a return to sanity. I'm in favor of transforming the world where it is abusive, needlessly violent, bigoted, and hateful. That includes law enforcement when they cross the lines. I'm in favor of a return to sanity and on to blessed change. Aren't you? That we need that power who is greater than ourselves. And for the Christians individually 
and his congregations, that is the triune God, revealed in Jesus Christ and poured into believers as the Holy Spirit. The church and the power of the Spirit can be a channel for healing, for works of fairness, and a forum for the dialogues that take place during the times of healing and of positive change. That's church talk. You know I so often preach for, about, and to the church. And that means my sermons are also addressed to myself, as is this one. What about we individuals, though, who want to receive the spirit afresh and pursue what makes for peace and righteousness for all? What can we do? Thanks for asking. One thing I found is in a devotional meditation, and it goes to receiving the Spirit. It says, Discipline of yourself is absolutely necessary before the power of God is given to you. When you see others manifesting the power of God, you probably have not seen the discipline that went before. They made themselves ready. All your life, is a preparation for more good to be accomplished when God knows that you are ready for it. So keep disciplining yourself in the spiritual life every day. Others will see the outward manifestation of the inward discipline in your daily living. And the brief prayer at the end said in part, I pray that I may discipline myself to, as to be ready to meet every opportunity. I like that. Remember Acts 1, verse 14. This is what the disciples, women and men, did. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together. So developing our own individual spirit-led disciplines of prayer, insight, generosity, patience, etc. This author of that devotional booklet says, is essential before the power of God is given to you. It is waiting in hope. As Isaiah 40 concludes famously, but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. However, I am reminded that over 55 years ago, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote a book called Why We Can't Wait. Protests and riots are underscored that the unheard have remained that way for another generation. I'm also reminded of a quote from Benjamin Franklin, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. So on our own, as we seek the Holy Spirit's outpouring, we who are not people of color can do some self-teaching by way of reading. I'll mention some things that, that I suggest to read, and I'm going to read the names and the authors slowly. It is my hope that I'll remember to put them in the announcements for next Sunday's bulletin. So if you're interested but you didn't have a pencil and paper, well, first of all, you can hit pause. Or you can wait and see these in the next week's bullet. Two books that engage at the level of white discomfort at discussing race are Anxious to Talk About It, Helping White Christians Talk Faithfully About Racism by Carolyn Kelson and by Michael Eric Dyson, White Fragility. Others, which can also be educational and important, include why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations about race in a newer edition by Beverly Daniel Tatum. Two, by Debron X. Kendi, K-E-N-D-I, stamped from the beginning, the definitive history of racist ideas in America. That's one. And the second, how to Be an Anti-Racist are good reads. Anxious to Talk About It, White Fragility, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, Stamped from the Beginning, How to Be an Anti-Racist. 
Now, beyond reading alone, is a piece on, there's a piece on the internet, and there are several, but I'm going to lift up one, well worth looking up and spending some time with. It is hosted by Equality Includes You. It's called 75 Things White People Can Do for Racial Justice by Corinne Schutak. 75 things white people can do for racial justice. Lastly, today, and we as individuals as well as churches can find faith-based groups that are focused on transforming racism and police brutality upon people of color. One is the United Church of Christ's own Board for a Local and Justice Church, for Justice and Local Church Ministries. The UCC's Board for Justice and Local Church Ministries. You can find that on the website of ucc.org. Our Illinois Conference has a Justice and Witness Committee. The Community Renewal Society in Chicago, Community Renewal Society, whom I know some of you have heard of, is yet another place. The Church and her allies bring the power of the Spirit of God into finding sanity, righteousness, peace, and justice. That's all kingdom stuff. That is Pentecost good news. All that's missing is us in the Spirit's power. Amen.
in silent prayer, and then I'll emerge us out of that with the Lord's Prayer, which we'll pray together. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you who create and renew the church, we once again lift our thanks for this amazing gift of yourself, your energy, compassion, and vision for the churches of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, we thank you for all the gifts you bestow upon your church and the world, your fruit of love, peace, joy, patience, gentleness, self-control, and more have been the salt preserving us in this crazy human world for the length of time. Since it's been and since we've been, take not your Holy Spirit from us, but use us as ambassadors of Christ, making your appeal to the neighborhoods and cultures through us. Among the gifts you give are relationships. We ask your blessing, God, on those in our church family who have birthdays this week. Jack Holler, Bart Bailey, Ben Reeves, Bart Todd, Christopher Taylor, and June Peterson, Carol and Ralph, Don and Lana, Nick and Susan, and Dale and Gina, all mark anniversaries this week. Bless them, we ask. We lift up those who are sick and those who are recovering, as well as those facing death. We pray for everyone with COVID-19. Send your healing peace and spirit of power to Marty, Lisa, Dorothy Taylor, Eva, Bruce, Seymour, Judy, Chris and Sarah, Doreen Sherman, Chad's cousin, Louis' nephew and Christie's friend fighting COVID and others. Use surgeries, research, and medical procedures as part of your healing plans, O great physician, and masks. Hold up caregivers, including Angela and Jenny, Merle, Charlie, and Christy. Keep them healthy and upright, along with all who labor at risk in hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, and at country passed the 100,000 mark of patients who died due to the virus. We lament for all the dead and for all the loved ones left behind. Use us to bring comfort and teach us to ask your Holy Spirit to be with us in such ministry. Again, we ask that you walk with all who mourn. For the whole of the Twin Cities, we pray. For the Floyds, Arbery's, Brianna Taylor's loved ones, and other victims of such violence. Pour out your Pentecost spirit on us, we humbly ask, so that what was seen as tongues of fire in the, in the book of Acts, now become our fires of love and justice, speaking in tongues of grace and truth. So fires from riots will diminish due to spiritual societal transformation. God, for our families and our loved ones, O oh Lord God, hear our prayer. For this church, and for all churches, we pray. We pray for the lonely, for the unemployed and fearful, for wisdom as parts of the state reopen and soon parts of Chicago, for wisdom and compassion to be with all in authority and those who can help meet the needs of those who have lost their jobs, so many, Lord, so many who may not have jobs to go back to. 
for those trapped in domestic violence, for those addicted, for those depressed, for those overworked, we ask your grace to move in ways they need. If we are the answer to our prayers for them, show us. And hear us, we ask, as our prayers continue in silence. prayers we offer up as incense ascends to your throne, and we make them in the name of Jesus, the one who is our source of hope, and who taught disciples that we might pray like this, like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This song, most of St. Peter's, I think, will recognize. If you've ever been a student in our Sunday school, you'll probably remember it too. It's called, When the Spirit of the Lord Moves in My Heart. I'll play it once through, and then I'm going to keep on going, and we'll start with verse 1. But this is how it goes. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I'll dance like David danced. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I'll dance like David danced. I'll dance, I'll dance, I'll dance like David danced. I'll dance, I'll dance, I'll dance like David danced. Okay, dance now, let's go. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I'll dance like David danced. Trust. 
can stop dancing now. Don't stop trusting. The apostles were given the gift of powerful speech. So with the gifts of the Spirit, let us all speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever.